We're going to take a look back at the year in politics with our regular panel, Ben Oquist, Executive Director of the Australia Institute, and David Gazard from DPG Advisory. You look at the numbers today, gentlemen, and just reaffirms how well-placed Australia is heading into Christmas. There's this uh, situation on the northern beaches of Sydney, but overall... I mean, compared to most countries in the world, you'd, you'd rather be here, David. Mm. Look, the, it almost looks like the way the, the roadmap out of this was set up has worked, you know, you, you can't say perfectly because obviously we're in a coming out of a recession, but there's been a bridge that's taken us from the first wave through to now. That seems to have worked. People are spending, people are returning to jobs, um, people are paying taxes, people are coming off welfare. It is that virtuous cycle, but, you know, there's plenty of work to do. Uh, the Treasurer made it very clear we're looking at, you know, four more years before we get back to unemployment where it was before the pandemic, so there's a lot of work to do. But, gee, you'd rather be us than most other countries in the world, wouldn't you? And there are some other issues at play, not just COVID. We'll get to yeah. China in a moment, but because uh, that's a big one. Mm. But um, when it comes to COVID, mm. there, there remains that uncertainty. And, and Josh Frydenberg at his news conference and then in his interview with me, mm. um, we're going to run that at five o'clock, but he was pleading with the states, don't, please don't lift your borders again on the basis of a handful of cases in New South Wales, particularly given New South Wales has been so effective in its testing, in its tracing... He, he pled with them, don't do not do it. But it looks like, you know, we're seeing some movement in WA, maybe, mm. that they might do just that. Well, you want to get the COVID under control, don't you? That's been the lesson here. I mean, two big things have happened why Australia is in such a good position. So we've got COVID under control. As the Treasurer has himself before said, uh, the best economic response is an effective health response. Get that under control. Then people aren't going to even really want to open the borders. But... The premiers are going to look at, want to look after their own state. And what we get to the end of the year, and what is proven, is if you get COVID under control, <coughs> the economy will start bouncing back. Having said that, of course, you've needed a massive federal government intervention, a massive Keynesian intervention, mm -hmm. a big job keeper package, a big job seeker package, a, a, a de debt and deficit uh, blown out the window. So, in a sense, what you've had to get Australia in this, in this position is health-led focus, plus massive Keynesian but, economics. But, but when you say, I mean, we talk about get it under control, New South Wales has had it under control. Mm -hmm. Whenever there's been a case, they've dealt with it. So, so I can see what the Treasurer is saying and urging Premiers, please don't act prematurely here then. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it does bring up the debate about suppression versus elimination, doesn't it? Um, mm. And, yes, um, New South Wales has had it under control and had a good contact uh, tracing system. But overall, what's best is if you start to eliminate it, and that's what everyone was starting to feel in New South Wales. Now, no one wants the borders closed, uh, but uh, getting COVID down to as low as possible yeah. is going gonna, is gonna to be the thing that stops states wanting to close their borders, uh, and it's going to lead to the best economic response. Health first, uh, and, and the economy will look after itself as long as uh, the federal government keeps um, propping up with a big Keynesian package. With Mark McGowan, though, if he were to lift it off the back of a handful of cases, uh, as the Treasurer said, he would see that as premature. Um, it, yeah. it reinforces the view, I think, that the WA systems might not be up to any sort of cases if they're that cautious that they can't... You know, you look at yeah. the, the population of New South Wales, a handful in, New, in yeah. Sydney, and they were to lift the borders again. Well, New South Wales has shown, I think you correctly identify this, it, it's the gold standard in what should be done, and this has been operating now for six or seven months. Like, there's no secret as to what New South Wales has done. They've been quite happy to share that. So, it, at some point, you veer from just suppression to sort of bloody-minded... Yeah. Parochialism, don't you? Um, you, you? You know, to, to actually potentially shut down all of that, you know, movement of people at Christmas time because you've got a handful of cases in a state that has proven to be very effective at, at jumping on top of outbreaks and fixing them before they've become problems. I mean, that, at some point, that just gets to be straight out destructive. And it would dent, and the Treasurer has said that, when I, you know, in that interview, that it, it would dent confidence. 
Yeah, it would absolutely dent not just business confidence but consumer confidence to see border removed, then reinstated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that would be damaging. Of course. Like in, in the last uh, GDP figures, not those that have been talked about today, um, consumer spending accounted for all of the growth. Mm. Um, business investment was actually down. And, of course, it's key to what is driving our growth as, as business investment fall. You need to lift the demand before business will invest and any assault on consumer confidence will be bad. But, of course, it's... The, the closures that would be in response to the virus getting out of control. And, uh, and of course, you don't want to open those borders, uh, close those borders prematurely. But I think the big lesson at the end of this year is those who advocated for a kind of a, a loosener opening up and the economy's got to come first have been proven wrong in the end. The effective health response, and yes, contact tracing is absolutely part of that, but put that first. And if there's any doubt, put that first, get it under control, then you can open up more quickly. The other thing, so if you look at the two big clouds over the, the mid-year budget update, mm. one is COVID, the uncertainty about it into 2021. The other is China. And the, the finance minister, the new finance minister, said that they've factored in some of the, the China impact, but that's what's happening thus far. We don't know what else is to come. And they look like they've got no intention to to stop this cycle right now. Yeah, every day seems to come with some new threat or um, some new impost on, on, on our exports. Um, I, I, I do draw some comfort from the fact that China has done this around the rest of the world over the last couple of years, and they do tend to be temporary or transitory. Um, Canada was in a similar situation to us only a few, a few months ago, and they're picking up some of the coal exports that we've we've given up. So but I don't think any country has <clears throat> copped it as relentlessly no. as Australia is copying it right now. No. Uh, and I, I think, you know, um, Scott Morrison has, has been, you know, global leader in terms of really leading the charge uh, to find the origins of, of COVID. Um, and, and he's been prepared to go out um, with the support of other Western liberal democracies, I might add, and, and, you know, sort of lead the charge against China. We, we now have got Bali going to the WTO, so we'll see where that ends up. But, yeah, it's, it's worrying because they're a very big trade partner. They sure are. And um, as I said to David, Ben, th this looks like the Chinese have got... Well, they, they're looking at this, you know, and if you look at a cost-benefit, they, they don't see any cost to them right now of what they're doing well, in terms of ba basically beating up on Australia, which they believe is sending a message to other countries as well. Mm, that's right. Uh, uh, of course, there is some cost both ways. And, you know, uh, uh, Australia's iron, iron ore is very, very valuable to China. But the reality is we're much smaller than China. It's going to affect us mm. much more than China. Mm. It is the growing superpower. It's the superpower of our region. And I don't think Australia has come to terms with that yet. We are a minnow compared to them. And I think that means a rethink of foreign policy, diplomacy, uh, and... I um, doesn't feel like the Australian government's had a plan for the rise of China and what's happening. And I, and I don't... Lots has been commented on about the Prime Minister's negative globalism speech last year, his speech to the UN when he singled out uh, China, the, um, uh, the, the optics of going for the uh, inquiry uh, on, on our own to start with. Yeah. If that was all planned, um, then... Uh, it, it looks pretty messy that this is the result. Yeah. So I, I think, um, hopefully, we have a reset, a renew think about diplomacy, a reinvestment in trade and aid and a public diplomacy program that sets Australia up for the future because this isn't going to go away. Uh, China's showing no sign of yeah. cha changing its <clears throat> behaviour. It's a superpower on the rise and we're a middle power. Yeah, well, exactly. Well said. But, I mean, the thing is, how, where do you find the off-ramp? Where, where, where is the way to calm this thing down because I tell you what, it's hard to see one. But, look, Ben's right to say you've got to look for areas of commonality, don't you? Yeah, although, I mean, I, I would say it was probably a year ago that you were looking for greater condemnation of Uyghur concentration camps. So they're, they're, you're dealing with a totalitarian state. It, 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 is, uh, it, it, it doesn't operate on the same um, uh, grounds as us. And I think... What China's doing is sending a message to the world that is dependent on Chinese goods um, that, that it's now the time to start shifting supply chain 
and supply lines away from China, uh, diversifying, and Australia's certainly been doing that since the beginning of the year by setting up uh, closer bilateral ties with India, with Cambodia, with Vietnam, strengthening the relationship with, with Japan. So we, we will pivot away from China, but it does show the inherent risks of having a, a, an export There's strategy. There's only so much you can pivot, yeah. though, isn't there? Because yeah, there, there is. And like, it's as a, Ben it's said, the iron ore situation, metallurgical coal, that's a mutual mm. benefit. The, but again, that that, 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 that's an essential service to, to China, yeah. and, and they've, they've seen higher costs in iron ore because they've, they've put an embargo on yeah. certain products here. So they, they're actually paying the price as well, not to mention the fact that uh, a greater slice of their population isn't getting the quality produce and materials or tourism opportunities or, you know, yeah. if it comes back, education opportunities that they, that they want in Australia. One thing that um, I've found really interesting is the, the, the China behaviour in the context of Trump. Um, this will be to watch how they manage a Biden administration, which goes back to a bit more normality in foreign policy and leadership in areas like climate change because the Chinese have sort of filled that vacuum of the United States to an extent what are the implications for Australia heading into 2021? Biden in the White House, Boris Johnson pushing for ambitious action out of the United Kingdom. Well, I think whoever's in the White House, Australia would have done better over a lengthy period of time and it can still pivot to have a more independent foreign policy. I, th I think it hasn't served us well of late to be looking like we're just echoing the US and particularly under Donald Trump, it hasn't served Australia as well. But even that goes with Biden. But obviously one of the... The big things, apart from uh, COVID in uh, 2020, has been the election of Biden and it's really going to shape uh, climate politics in particular for 2021. Um, you've got the big climate conference at the end of 2021 in Glasgow. You've got a Conservative Prime Minister in Boris Johnson pushing the world to act more, wanting yeah. Glasgow to succeed. And you've got a Biden administration now saying uh, climate change is important. It is isolating uh, Scott Morrison. You can, you can feel that isolation on the international stage and it is already forcing him to move. He hasn't cancelled those Kyoto credits yet, but he's made the signal that he wants to cancel those Kyoto credits. You wouldn't have picked that a year ago and that's because of international pressure. Australia is the only developed country without the net zero target by 2050. That, that's not possible for that to be sustained um, throughout uh, 2021. I think the, those, those forces within the Liberal Party who have agitated against climate action are weaker, but I still think they're strong in the National Party, and that's the challenge for the Prime Minister. How does he deal mm. with the Nats who are still saying, no, we don't want to do any more climate you, action? Yeah, that's... It's, um, the, well, the, within the Liberal Party, you've got some very strong voices for the government to lean in on this particular matter. Uh, I spoke to one yesterday, Matt Keane, the New South Wales Minister, one of the strongest advocates for action of any party. Mm. So the Liberals have he's a broad church, don't yeah, they? He's out of step with his own Premier um, on, on certain aspects of energy policy. Um, I, I actually look at this through a different lens um, to, to Ben. I, I, I look at, at uh, where we're going um, on, on climate because I think the Prime Minister's got the, the luxury of being able to move uh, possibly more to the left if he wants to, and he's already indicated that, you know, it's not going to get hung up on, on particular targets. He's pragmatic. He'll Com do it. He is completely pragmatic, but you have a complete schism inside the Labor Party hi highlighted by Joel Fitzgibbon over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, you've now got a fight over whether fossil fuels goes into the platform, um, and you've got a, a primary vote for the Labor Party that is so low yeah. that they cannot win government without the support of the Greens. Is there a concern for Scott Morrison, though, you know, with the base, if he were to to do that? It's just symbolism. I mean, it is symbolism. I, I, saw, know a, that I, I it, saw a poll the other day. But it day. doesn't cost anything, yeah, that I, target. Look, it's a, it's a big discussion in Canberra, but if you look at the results of the Queensland state election, um, the environment was a vote driver for 9% of the population, and those were committed Green or Labor voters. Um, there, there, is a, there is a case for the cost to getting where we're going, and that is one of the, the biggest weapons that, that the Prime Minister has in his arsenal because everyone else has set a target without worrying about the cost it brought... The PM's got it, a plan. Correct. As Paul Kelly it, wrote it the, the it, last he, couple of days. He, he's not going to move there target. without knowing what the implications are, and, and, and that is the implication for the taxpayer. We're almost out of time, Ben, mm. but th that's the interesting uh, scenario, isn't it, that 
he says we need a plan. Well, they have got the plan, the low technology plan, but, no but not the target. Yeah, I, I think that they're going to have to. That, as Paul Kelly also said in that piece, um, net zero by 2050 is going to start to look pretty weak soon. The debate's moving very fast and, and there's going to be pressure on the 2030 target, the 2035 target. Uh, Matt Keane, um, the, <laughs> the South Australian uh, government, uh, the Tasmanian government, the ACT yeah. government backed by the Liberals are all moving and I think that's also driving pressure internally on the Liberals to do more. Gentlemen, great to chat. Thanks so much for the year too. Thanks, Lovely Graham. catching up with you every week. David mm. Gazzard, Ben Oakquist, I hope you have a, a restful break. Thank yeah, you both. too. Yeah, you too. See you soon after the... the bottom uh, 20% uh, get nothing. They're really unfair tax cuts. People want to see much stronger action from the government when it comes to climate change. Wages are growing at their slower, sustained pace. Transitioning to net zero emissions, it doesn't seem like there's much room for gas.